Church, we're in Philippians chapter 2 again this week, Philippians chapter 2, as we continue in this series called A Call to Joy. Today, we're going to talk about a little help from our friends. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 19 through 30. You know, there's a funny saying that no good deed goes unpunished. Well, Alexandra Van Horn was in an auto accident as her car began to produce smoke, her friend, Lisa Torty, who feared that the car would explode and burn her friend alive, heroically pulled Alexander from the wreckage. How did her friend thank her? Van Horn, who suffered paralysis in the accident, sued her friend Lisa, claiming that she caused the injury. I mean, who knew that being a friend today could be such a costly endeavor? Of course, when we hear stories like that, you know, we, we can harden our hearts. We can try to keep people at arm's length and never let ourselves v- be vulnerable enough to really enjoy the pleasures of true friendship. Friends who can encourage and affirm. Friends who, who, whom you can trust with both your secrets and your valuables, you know. Uh, those kind of friends are hard to find. But you see, we were created for community, and we function better when we're surrounded by faithful friends. Now, true confession time, the big goofy pastor guy that usually greets you when you come in the Welcome Center on Sunday mornings, he is not by nature an extrovert. In fact, I am very much introverted by nature. Unlike my wife, who's a very socially outgoing person, that doesn't come to me easily. So it should come as no surprise to you that after finishing half of my degree at Wayland Baptist University out in the Texas Panhandle and transferring to Southwest Baptist University in Missouri where I knew absolutely no one, I struggled. I mean, sitting in a cafeteria full of other students and eating alone was a miserable experience. But thankfully, there was Ben, who in approaching me started us on a lifelong journey of friendship. We ended up being roommates our senior year. He was the best man at my wedding. I ended up being the best man at his wedding. Even named my middle son after him. And even though I don't see Ben that much anymore since he lives way up in Wisconsin, I know, did you notice how I said that? Wisconsin. Yeah. Oh, you betcha. Yeah, he lives up in Wisconsin. You know, I know that even today I could count on Ben for for most anything. I know that he would go the extra mile for me in a heartbeat. But it's sad that in the world we live in today, that sort of relationship is really more the exception than it is the rule. Even in some churches, even in Paul's day, Mutual concern wasn't necessarily a popular virtue. I mean, even the Christians in Rome were not particularly interested in the needs of the church at Philippi. In fact, Paul said he couldn't find one person among them who was willing to go to Philippi. But today, as we look at verses 19 through 30, I'm mindful of the lyrics from an old Beatles song. And yes, I'm dating myself with this reference. But the lyric goes... I get by with a little help from my friends. Now, in Paul's case, those friends we're talking about were Timothy and Epaphroditus. And the example that we get from these men really brings us to the big idea behind today's message, that Christians are to care for one another like family. Well, in today's text, Paul introduces us to these, these two guys, these two partners in ministry, and they're average Joes. I mean, neither was an apostle, neither had the religious pedigree that Paul had, uh, neither had done great you know, supernatural working of miracles or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, they were just two servants whose faithfulness and sacrifice serve as an example for all of us. So let's take them one at a time. First of all, we find the example of Timothy. All right, so who, just who was Timothy? Well, Timothy was a young man originally from Lystra in modern-day Turkey. He grew up in a multicultural house with a Greek father and a Jewish 
Christian mother and grandmother. Now, his exposure to both the, the Greek and the Jewish culture actually served him very well as he helped Paul spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul had led Timothy to the Lord at a very young age, and Timothy would eventually become very instrumental in Paul's ministry. Timothy was with Paul in, in Corinth. He was sent to Macedonia. He was with Paul on the return trip from Jerusalem. And he assisted Paul in the writing of Romans, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. And so for years, Paul would rely on Timothy. And because of his exposure to Paul's influence and teachings and, and, and his eventual partnership with Paul and his travels, Timothy became a loyal servant of Christ and a trusted friend on whom Paul could always depend. Now, there's three specific traits that we find in Timothy that I want to take a closer look at this morning. Three, three things that I think we should emulate in our own lives. And the first one is this. Timothy had a servant's mind. Look at verses 19 through 21. Paul writing to the church at Philippi says, Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be encouraged by the news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interests and not those of Jesus Christ. Paul describes him in glowing terms. Nobody else like him who's, who's like-minded. It's the picture of two kindred spirits working side by side in, in ministry. But see, uh, unlike those people that Paul was describing in verse 21, the servant-minded Timothy actually served the interests of Christ. He sought Christ's interests first. Now, back in 1936, Dale Carnegie wrote the now well-known book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And many an eager reader has employed Carnegie's counsel on six ways to make people like you, or 12 ways to, to win people to your way of thinking, or nine ways to, to change people without arousing resentment, that kind of stuff. But you know, Timothy, he was not interested in, in winning friends and influencing people. He realized he didn't need to do all that stuff to make a difference. All he had to do was show that he cared. Yes, Timothy was an excellent student of the Word. He would go on to become a very capable pastor. But somewhere along the way, he probably came to understand that for anyone to be an effective minister of the gospel, he must love people. See, the old adage is true. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. He genuinely cares, Paul says. That means Timothy was the real deal, y'all. He had a servant's mind. He was genuinely interested in the welfare of other people. Now, we know that Paul had been concerned about the church at Philippi, and he wanted to send someone to, to relay his concern and to offer help. But there's something puzzling going on here. Now, back in chapter 1 of Philippians, verse 15, writing with the, the Christians in Rome in mind, Paul said this. He said, to be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. Now, there were likely hundreds of Christians in Rome at the time. I mean, Paul greets 26 of them alone in chapter 16 of Romans. And yet we find here in chapter 2, verse 21 of Philippians, not a single one of them was willing to make the trip to Philippi. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ, Paul says. I, I guess they just assumed that somebody else would step up and do it. Or maybe they were just too engrossed in their own internal affairs to really take notice. So nobody even lifted a finger to help. But I find that that's actually pretty typical of some of the problems that churches create for themselves today. That they, they divert time and energy and focus and concern away from some of the things that really matter the most. 
But you see, Timothy, he did not get caught up in church politics. He wasn't interested in, in promoting any party or supporting any cause or, or movement within the church that would create division. You see, his primary concern was just the spiritual condition of the people. And that really became second nature to him. Now, how did that happen? Well, the explanation is really found in the second trait that Paul emphasizes regarding Timothy. Not only did Timothy have a servant's mind, Timothy also had a servant's training. Look at verse 22. But you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with the father. Now, in the Greek text, that word for proven, it, it means a, a testing process of endurance that validates the character of the one undergoing it. Now, in the first century, that's also a, a word that was used to describe the way metals were tested and purified by fire. We see Timothy had to prove his character. He had to be tested before Paul would add him to his mission team. Now, Paul didn't plug Timothy in from day one, wasn't going to put Timothy's hand to the proverbial plow before he was prepared. And, and think back to, Paul, uh, to Paul's conversion. I mean, he actually had to undergo a period of, of discipleship before he was ready to enter into public ministry. So Paul left Timothy behind to become part of the church and fellowship at, at uh, Derby and Lystra. And it was in that fellowship of believers that Timothy really began to grow in spiritual matters and learned how to serve the Lord. And then when Paul re returned to that area a few years later, he was no doubt elated to learn that young Timothy was spoken highly of in Lystra and Iconium, as it says in Acts chapter 16. Paul knew what he was doing in the way he handled Timothy, the way he handled his training. I mean, you'll recall that years later, writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, he, he wrote about the importance of permitting new converts to grow before thrusting them into important positions of leadership in the church. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. He writes, he must not be a new convert or he might become conceited and <laughs> incur the same condemnation as the devil. I remember as a 19-year-old freshman at Wayland Baptist University majoring in church music and working at the campus radio station KWLD, I got to interview Greg Voltz, the lead singer for the Christian band Petra. They were coming to do a concert in Amarillo. And uh, after the interview was over, I remember telling him that I wanted to be a Christian singer. And I asked him for any advice that he could give me for, for breaking into the biz. <laughs> How surprising to me at the time. He really told me to just stay active singing in church. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking, what? No, no juicy tips from the industry insider? But you see, Greg Voltz understood that for one who wanted to be effective in ministering to others in Jesus' name, I had to grow. I needed to be united to a solid Bible-believing church and to be discipled despite what talents I may or may not have had. And besides, at that age and in that stage of my spiritual development, had I actually gotten some miraculous break in the music industry, it likely would have done me much more harm than good. In fact, I might have become conceited and incurred the same condemnation as the devil. I needed to know that God would open up places for me to serve as I became more ready. And let me tell you something, church. After making straight C's in, in freshman music theory that year, I quickly realized music ministry was not my calling after all. Here's the point. Paul didn't give Timothy too much too soon. He gave him time to grow, and then he enlisted him to do the work uh, with him on his missionary tours. He had schooled Timothy in the Word and let him watch and learn from Paul's example. And guess what? That's just exactly the way Jesus did it too. 
He would give his disciples personal instruction balanced with on-the-job experience. Because experience without teaching, well, you know, that can lead to discouragement. And teaching without experience can lead to spiritual deadness. So it takes an equal measure of both. So we find that not only did Timothy have a servant's mind, Timothy had a servant's training. But now as we look at verses 23 and 24, we find out be that because of those two things, Timothy also had a servant's reward. Look at verse 23. Therefore I hope to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I myself will also come soon. You see, God would reward Timothy for his faithfulness. And, and, and I think we see this come to pass in three different ways. I think to begin with, Timothy had the joy that comes from serving others. Now to be sure, there was going to be plenty of hardships and difficulties along the way. I mean, just as he'd seen Paul have. But there were also going to be victories and, and blessings to come too. Now Timothy also had the joy of serving Paul, ministering alongside the, the great apostle and assisting him in some of his most difficult assignments. Timothy had become a very valuable friend and ministry partner in the gospel mission. My dearly loved and faithful child in the Lord, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, chapter 17. In fact, so valuable to Paul was Timothy that Paul mentioned him at least 24 times in his letters. Two of those letters actually addressed to Timothy. But I think probably the greatest reward that God gave to Timothy was to actually choose him to be Paul's replacement when it came time for God to call Paul home. But what an honor! Timothy was not only Paul's spiritual son, and Paul's servant. But Timothy would go on to become Paul's substitute. And that's why the name Timothy is so well respected among Christians. You see, like Timothy's, the mind that is fully submitted to Christ, it's not the product of, of some 35-minute sermon that you hear on a Sunday morning. It's not the product of some sort of training seminar or even a year's worth of service. The mind that is fully focused on Christ is something that grows in us over time, day after day, week after week, year after year, just like Timothy, as we learn to follow God's leadership in our lives. Now, as we move on to verses 25 through 30, we're going to find another example of faithfulness that really bears closer examination. And that's, number two, the example of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, he was a member of the Philippian church who had risked his health and his life to carry their missionary, missionary offering to Paul in Rome. And we'll learn more about that when we get to Philippians chapter 4. <laughs> that funny sounding name, Epaphroditus, it actually means charming. <laughs> but there's, there's three characteristics of this charming man in these verses that I think are really worthy of note. Now, first of all, we find that Epaphroditus was a balanced Christian. Look at verse 25. But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need. Man, Paul could not say enough good things about Epaphroditus, your messenger and minister to my need. And notice how else he describes him. My, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier. It was a picture of a very well-rounded, well-balanced Christian, e exemplary of the type of things that Paul had already been addressing back in chapter 1. Now remember back to the first three installments of our series. We talked in the first part of chapter 1 about the, the fellowship of the gospel. We talked about the fording of the gospel. We talked about the faith of the gospel. But you see, those three things about Epaphroditus actually exemplify those things that Paul was writing about. The fellowship of the gospel. Epaphroditus exemplified that as a brother. The forwarding of the gospel. He exemplified that as a co-worker. The faith of the gospel. He exemplified that as a fellow soldier. He's a very well-balanced Christian. 
Balance is important in the Christian life. It's in, very important in the church. You know, but uh, some are so involved in defending the faith of the gospel that they neglect the fellowship with other believers. And others emphasize the fellowship so much that they forget the forwarding of the gospel. Dr. H.A. Ironside used to tell a story of a group of believers who were very inwardly focused. Their main emphasis was fellowship, and they gave very little thought to, to reaching the lost or really even to equipping themselves to defend the Christian faith against its enemies. And so in front of their church, they, they put up a sign that said, Jesus only. And then a big wind came and blew away some of the letters, blew away the letters J-E-S. So it just said, us only, which I think was, was you know, fitting, fitting description for that church. But you see, that's not the mark of a Christian or of a church that's balanced. Epaphroditus was a balanced Christian. Now, I want you to notice something else about Epaphroditus. He was a burdened Christian. Look at verse 26. Since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Now look at verse 30. Risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. He was a burdened Christian in a couple of ways. First of all, he was burdened for Paul. When Epaphroditus heard that Paul was a prisoner in Rome, he volunteered to make that long arduous, dangerous trip to Rome to stand at Paul's side and to assist him. And he carried the church's love gift with him, protecting it with his own life. You know, I think our churches today, especially churches here in America, really need more men and women who are burdened for others and burdened for the gospel. You know, the, the problem is in a lot of those churches, though, we've got too many spectators and not enough participants. Epaphroditus was a burdened Christian. He had a burden for Paul, but I want you to notice he also had a burden for the church. Now, why is that? Well, because they were worried about him. After arriving in Rome, he became very ill, almost died. And that delayed his return to Philippi. And so the people there became very concerned about him. But Epaphroditus was not burdened about himself. He was burdened over the people in Philippi because they were burdened over him. You see, like Timothy, he really had a natural concern for others. Now, you see that word in verse 26, distressed, that Epaphroditus was distressed. That Greek word, it, it means to be in anxiety. In fact, it's the very same word that was used to describe Christ as he prayed in anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26. And like Jesus Christ, Epaphroditus knew the meaning of sacrifice and service. He was a burdened Christian. But get this, Epaphroditus was also a blessed Christian. Look at verse 28. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice again when you see him and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him, him in the Lord with great joy and hold people like him in honor because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Why was Epaphroditus so blessed? Because he was a blessing. What a tragedy to go through our lives and never be a blessing to somebody. Epaphroditus was a blessing to Paul, we know that. He stood with him in prison. Didn't even permit his own sickness to hinder his service to Paul. He was also a blessing to his own church. Paul instructed the church to receive Epaphroditus with joy and to hold him and people like him in honor to the glory of God because of his sacrifice and service. So he was a blessing to Paul and he was a blessing to his own church. 
You ever know people like that? It's, it, it seems like their sole purpose in life is just to be a blessing to others. A pastor named Vernal Sims, he had pastored in Philadelphia years ago. He once wrote this. He said, I grew up on a rough Boston housing project called Columbia Point in a family of nine children. Although I'd been a hardworking student, paying for college seemed impossible. But my mother's favorite expression was, pray and the Lord will make a way somehow. I viewed that as good advice for other people. But when I decided to go to college and seminary, because I believed the Lord had a call in my life, I had no other choice. I packed for college, even went to orientation, but I still didn't have any money. I'd have to pack up my belongings and make the 100-mile trip back home. But an heir to a corporate fortune heard about my plight and paid for my college and seminary education. After I graduated, I went to my benefactor's office to thank him for all he'd done for me and to ask him what I could do to pay him back. <laughs> Imagine my saying to a multimillionaire, what can I do to repay you? The man responded, help somebody. I've spent the last 20 years in the ministry with that goal in mind, and I've learned that the blessing of God is like a boomerang. As I've tried to help somebody, the Lord has blessed me. Like Vernal Sims, like Epaphroditus, like Timothy, let's help somebody, church. Let's be the blessing. Bless somebody and be blessed. Epaphroditus was a blessing to Paul. He was a blessing to his church. But get this, Epaphroditus is also a blessing to you and I today because he proves to us that the joyful life is the life of sacrifice and service, the life that is fully surrendered to God's leadership. And he proves to us that that life really works. Now, as we studied a couple of weeks ago, Christ has already given us the example of humility and, and submission. We read about that in verses 5 through 11. Then the next week, Paul showed us how we are able to live that out, how we're empowered by God. That's in verse 13. But now, Timothy and Epaphroditus are the proof that this submission thing really works. So what about us, church? Are we fully surrendered to God? What about our sacrifice and service? Are we truly the kind of folks that, like Timothy and Epaphroditus, we can see our friends get by with a little help? Or are we failing to get the job done? Do we have too many spectators in the church and not enough participants And can we really say that we're that balanced? I mean, with, with equal focus on worship and discipleship and fellowship and, and outreach and service, or do we just kind of like to camp out on one or two of those things? You see, the reality is that every Christian either lives in Philippians 1.21 or in Philippians 2.21. Philippians 1.21 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 2.21 says, All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And you know what? If it's the second, well, then we can't live out the big idea that Christians are to care for one another like family. You want to be the blessing? You want to help a friend get by? I can give you a few suggestions to kind of start you on the right path. Let me give you four action steps. First of all, reach out. Reach out. Reach out to people in your sphere of influence. You know, first of all, those who, who don't know Christ as Savior. Maybe that's a coworker or a neighbor or an unsaved family member. So reach out. But here's something else. Here's something else you can do. Get the names of the people that you encounter 
here at Beach Street who have visited for the first time or have come to visit your life group for the first time and follow up with them. Okay? Don't, don't expect that your life group uh, director or your life group teacher is going to do that for you. Take that task upon yourselves. Everybody, everybody in your group, reach out to those new people. And just imagine if you're a person who's visiting a small group for the first time and every single person in that group reaches out to you somehow, some way to say, oh, we love the fact that you came to visit us. How can we bless you? You know, maybe invite them to come to lunch with you or coffee or a group fellowship. Imagine what sort of retention we would have in our life groups if we just simply reach out. But here's another action step. Reach in. When was the last time you visited, called, texted, emailed, sent a card to members that you haven't seen in a while? Oh, I wonder what became of so, oh, so and so. Well, I, I, I don't know. You see, it's really hard to answer that question if nobody lifts a finger to contact them. And I'm telling you, church, this is where our life groups are really meant to thrive in our ministry to one another. That's where the true ministry within the body of Christ is meant to take place, through your small groups. Reach out to those people you haven't seen in a while. I ran into somebody at, at Richard's funeral rest yesterday who introduced himself as someone who used to come to our church. He's actually one of our homebound members, and very few people have actually reached out to him. But think of how we could bless each other if we were to live that way. Reach out, reach in. Here's another one, relieve. Relieve a need. Help somebody volunteer within the community. Maybe that's Mission Texarkana. Maybe that's something else. Reach out, reach in, relieve, serve the body of Christ. You see a need? Go meet that need. And don't assume that somebody else is going to take care of it. Be the blessing, and you're going to get blessed in return. Here's the last one, and it kind of comes full circle to the first one. Remember the lost. Y'all, remember, there is a whole world full of people out there who aren't blessed the way you and I are because they don't know the joy of a relationship with the Lord. You know, maybe they haven't gotten by with a little help from their friends. So pray for them. As a young man in Dublin, Ireland, Joseph Scriven enrolled in a military college to prepare for an army career. But poor health forced him to give up that dream. Soon after that came another crushing blow. His fiance had died in a drowning accident on the eve of their wedding in 1844. Later that year, he moved to Ontario, Canada, and his plans for marriage were dashed once again when his new bride-to-be died after a short illness in 1855. And in his depression... Scriven penned these words. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. What needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Proverbs 18.24 tells us that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know who that friend is? It's Jesus. Jesus Christ is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is that friend. He is the one that you can always count on. And he's not going to just help you get by. He's going to help you thrive. See, Jesus said in John 10.10 10, that a thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He came to give us abundant life on earth. He also came to give us eternal life in heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. 
abundant life on earth, eternal life in heaven, strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow, as the old hymn says. See, Jesus Christ can be your friend forever if you just call on him. If you'd like to have a personal relationship with God, it's pretty simple. It's repent, believe, and receive. You see, we acknowledge that we're all sinners and we fall short, and so we repent. That word means to change your mind. You change your mind about the, the way you've been living, and you go the other way. And then you choose to believe by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for you. And then you choose by faith to receive God's free gift of forgiveness and salvation and eternal life. It's a very simple transaction, but it's one that will change your life forever.